to, we can go to the other um, uh, essay question or talk about anything you can to. Um, the NBA playoffs, for example. <laughs> Beat Miami. Beat Miami. That's, I, I know that's, all I, that's all I'm looking for. I, I don't care who it is. Um, so. Babylon on the beach. Krusty is a local business owner in the seaside town of Babylon Beach. A man of many talents, Krusty operates a fireworks factory, a motel, and a construction development business. Only in school would you find a person like this. Um, while business has been good for a number of years, he's lately been doing it. The world is turning out of a specific city town. A vocal opponent to land use regulation in general, Krusty is a regular attendee at land use hearings where he frequently harangues the planning commissioner and staff on property rights issues within the city administration. Krusty is known as a problem citizen. Citing recent searches in residential development and concerns about public safety, the city attempt, adopted an amendment to its zoning ordinance 10 months ago that eliminates fireworks manufacturing as a permissible use anywhere in the city. The amendment allows existing factories to continue to operate for an additional four years, except in circumstances where the factory is bordered uh, of 12 or more residences. Under those conditions, fireworks manufacturing must cease immediately. There are several fireworks factories in Babylon, but Krusty's is the only one close to residential areas. In fact, Krusty's factory has been bordered by three modest homes for more than years. Why do modest? Um, um, a recent surge in vacation home sales, however, has led to a small building boom in Babylon, and Krusty has learned uh, that an out of town developer has just received preliminary flat approval for a subdivision that would place an additional 10 homes on the border of Krusty's factory, bringing the total number of homes on the border up to 13, right? Yeah. Mistake? No. Deciding to take advantage of the strong home market itself, Krusty starts looking for available vacant properties in the town. He finds a promising single parcel near the edge of the town, known for a months, half acre minimum lot size. Though the property looks dry, preliminary analysis shows that about five of the acres, five out of the ten acres, are seasonal wetlands. He 
uh, seasonal wetlands provide important water storage capacity during the rainy winters in Babylon. The city has pro uh, prohibited development of seasonal wetlands to avoid potential city-wide flooding problems. Trusty knows about the prohibition. It purchases the land anyway. Two weeks after the purchase, Trusty submits a preliminary plat to the city showing 20 half-acre lots. Citing the presence of wetlands, the city planning commission denies the plat. Sensing that the market and vacation rentals may be strengthening, almost strengthening, Trusty decides to start developing a seaside lot that he purchased 10 years ago. The lot consists entirely of dry sand beach. And for as long as anyone can remember from time immemorial, that stretch of beach has been used by members of the public visiting the state park that borders the custody of the lot on the south, recognizing the importance of continued unhindered beach access to the regional economy. Babylon, several years ago, adopted a zoning provision that prohibits structures from dry sand areas and cities beaches. Custody, nevertheless, submits an application for approval to build five rustic Vanna style cabins on the site. The planning commission turns Krusty down, citing the Vanna concept. When Krusty arrives home from the planning commission meeting, there is an official letter from the city informing him that the city has recently authorized a private security company to install video surveillance cam cameras in the lobbies of all hotels and motels in the city. The video feeds from the cameras will be sent to the police department where the police can better assess whether there are any possible terrorists who might be lodging in the city's hotels and motels. The letter states that the installers will arrive at Krusty's motel the next Monday. At this latest affront, Krusty finally loses his control, his cool, and decides to immediately sue the city, claiming that fireworks, wetlands, dry sand, and surveillance camera ordinance provisions are illegal and constitutional, and that they have effectively taken his property, thus requiring the city to compensate him. He's heard that you have taken a rigorous course in language law and figures that he can get some cheap advice from you on his likely, likelihood of prevailing in his lawsuit. What do you tell him? Oh, Lordy. What a mother of all exam questions. Um, aside from the obvious um, tee up for unauthorized practice of law, which you all know that's the first issue for you to get started in writing your essay. <clears throat> what is the primary issue here? Take takings. Takings and all its glory. What else? Before we dig into takings and start peeling that honey, what other issues are in here? Non conforming use. Non conforming use. Right? Yeah. What else? Amortization. Amortization, non-conforming use. Nuisance. Yes, nuisance. Public nuisance, particularly. Easements. Easements. Prescriptive easements. Prescriptive easements. With the beach. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Right, good. Thank you. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> Occupation. Well, that's the prescriptive easement. Oh, OK, gotcha. Or well, the camera. Yeah, but that's yes. a takings issue. We'll get to the takings in a second. What else? The wetland stuff. Yeah, what about wetlands? Well, you've got the existing conditions of the three houses next to his. Uh, yeah, couldn't that be a private nuisance coming to the. Could be a private nuisance, yeah. Substantive due process, right? Oh, yeah. The, is the city acting within the scope of its constitutional authority to, to pass a regulation or a series of regulations on any of these topics? Are these topics, areas of legitimate governmental concern, has the city uh, effectively promoted and protected those uh, areas of concern through this regulation um, and acted in a way that is not arbitrary and capricious? Yes. yes. What? Yeah, but that, 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 is, <laughs> that is the question. That, uh, and and, and you, you should always have that running, and you should always be looking for Right, always be looking for that in any of these questions because that's always a, a kind of a foundational issue. Because if, if we're talking about a governmental regulation, then you don't even get really um, logically to any of these other questions if the 
the government has acted beyond the, the uh, constitutional scope of its power to uh, regulate for health, safety, and welfare, and then, right? Because it's, it's only after you've established that it has can you start looking at these other issues. Yes. And of the three issues that uh, have been brought forward in this story, the third one is the one that's probably the least uh, within the rights of the city and has the cameras for the terrorist, uh, you know, observation. Because really, that is more of a federal issue as opposed to a city issue. Uh, the other thing is, is they they stated that they were going to be in next week to install those cameras without giving him a right for due process to right. to uh, argue against his. So there's a right. potentially a procedural due process. Yeah. Issue. yeah. The other two issues seem to be fairly well founded and substantiated. So. So let's talk about the two. Okay, so we've got. Can I can point. I can I make before you sure one that quick observation from a business perspective he made the wrong move he went out to buy ground outside on the edge of town as opposed to buying one of those lots next to his uh, uh, fireworks sta sta station okay. Okay. and well, then yeah. and then hence forever block that uh, thirteen lot uh, yes. minimum requirement yes I mean that was kind of. That would be my first recommendation right there. <laughs> to go buy, buy one of the lots. Yeah, buy one of the lots and not allow a home to be built on it. That's that's true. That's true. Anyway. Um, as you know, it's a similar reason why um, the University of Utah I've always been told this. I know it was never affirmed or denied it for me, but I understand it's the university's policy to always um, uh, it, it investigate and potentially purchase uh, properties that come for sale um, around the university's perimeter so that they can control the perimeter. Um, and then they rent them out to you know, students at um, inflated prices. No. Uh, <laughs> but, but then they are the owners of the property that are neighboring the university. So if there's complaints about what the university is up to, whoa, we're, we're our own neighbors. Um, it's kind of handy. OK, so now. Um, looking at the, uh, the takings issues one by one, we start with the fireworks spec. So we now have this order uh, to uh, uh, cease um, all fireworks production uh, immediately in places where we have um, 12 or more residences. And it looks like that trigger has been uh, tripped. Um, or has I mean, it's a, it's a factual question. We have a plat, but we don't have residences. And it could take three or four years. And it could take, it could take forever, because there are unbuilt plats all over, especially the West. Um, so just because it's platted doesn't necessarily mean that this uh, uh, trigger has been tripped. Um, there's an argument either way. And I, this, when I was writing this, I intentionally made it ambiguous so that you could argue that. Right? Right. Um. <coughs> but the, but the four-year uh, amortization would kick in. Then, either anyway, way, right? Either way, the four-year the amortization would kick in. And so the question is whether um, uh, this is uh, constitutional. Um, there is the non-conforming use um, um, stuff, and so you probably want to write about non-conforming uses. And um, we had that one, uh, just that one case, the Avco case, um, the Avco uh, cement uh, plant um, on the river case. Uh, that was our amort one amortization case. And if you recall that case, the, the issue about whether the amortization process was legal um, and not affecting a taking. Um, had to do with the criteria that were applied and whether the um, uh, criteria allowed adequate return on investment um, before the closure. And so that would be the big issue. We don't have any data on, on here about that. Um, why? Because it was, it was already a very long um, uh, question. I didn't want to add more data about return on investment. I could have. But that would be an open question. You want to see, probably say something about that. 
Um, as far as uh, takings are concerned, um, this is where public nuisance comes kicks in, right? Um, no one, if, if, if indeed it's uh, determined that it's a public nuisance, and you need one to analyze public nuisance first, maybe. You, if it is, in fact, a public nuisance, there is no compensable right for, to which the, um, um, uh, or on which the, the government would be liable because no one has the right to engage in nuisance activities. And you might say, well, why is it a nuisance now when it hasn't been in the past? You could say, well, um, you know, uh, brick manufacturing in, uh, outside of Los Angeles was not a nuisance either until the city grew up to engulf the, the, uh, the brick factory. And then it became a nuisance um, because of a change of circumstances. Um, so, and then health, safety, and welfare, uh, fireworks manufacturing being a probably inherently um, uh, dangerous activity. Um, or we can now add to that list if I were writing this today, it might be um, fertilizer manufacturing. Um, you know, scary stuff. Um, so, probably a pretty strong health, safety, and welfare um, uh, concern here. And, um, uh, probably not taking again to, uh, uh, because um, if it is indeed uh, um, a public nuisance, there is no compensable right. No right to engage in nuisance. Other issues having to do with fireworks? Anybody else saw? It? Yeah, I, I just have a question on it. But yeah. um, with the, the flat issues and it not being built out, would there be anything in there? Uh, vesting rights and things like that. Well, yeah, but it, it, keep in mind that the question is asking you to advise crusty. And so um, the, uh, the developer, out of state developer who's got, got the plat, might have some vesting issues. But um, you're, not, you're not answering his questions. You're asking Crusty's questions. Always good to keep that in mind. Re 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 um, um, Play, uh, remember your role in the drama, right? And when you get teed up, I always end the question with with something like I, I have here, which just says, you are to tell this person this information about those issues. Keep that in mind, because uh, especially a question, question that's this complex, you can go off wandering <laughs> in all sorts of different directions. And I try to kind of uh, put some sideboards on for you. So, yeah. Could you? Argue that the fireworks stay, stand is a um, existing non-conforming use, and that the housing lots are coming to the problem. That, so it's not a private nuisance. Well, but we've but, talked about this before, so I'm glad you bring that up. Let's 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 talk again about nuisance, whether it's public nuisance or private nuisance. Um, it is not a complete defense to say that someone came to the nuisance. Can I say that again. Yeah. It's not a complete defense for the uh, owner of a brick, whether it's a brick factory or a, a fireworks factory, to just say, oh, I'm not liable for the alleged nuisance that you're suing me for because you came to it. It's all your damn fault. <laughs> um, if the fact that someone did knowingly move uh, to uh, uh, an area proximate to the nuisance activity is relevant, it's not to say that it's completely irrelevant, it is, but it's not conclusive. What's really important is, are those factors that we talked about when we studied these things, blow these many months ago, about context. Gravity of harm, the plaintiff, the utility of the conduct, for both of them can defend it, for both the, the operator is being uh, um, sued, as well as the person who is complaining the nuisance. What, how, what social utility is there in both of their um, respective conducts? Is the, are there respective conducts, both the um, uh, perpetrator and the complainer, defended by them? Are there respective uses of land appropriate given the context, given the other uses that are going on in the surrounding area. What are the costs to each party 
to make the nuisance a bit. The cost of avoidance to define that, the cost to cure before they defend. Those are the factors that really drive nuisance. Not whether not the chronology so much, not whether somebody came to the nuisance. I kind of hammer on that a bit because I've, I've seen in the past that students kind of rush to that too quickly. To just say, oh, he gave the news, it's odd, so it's all done. Uh, and, and no, because when you look at the, you read the cases, that doesn't explain the outcome reliably in the nuisance uh, cases. That we just read a few, but I mean, even the, in the two primary ones that we read, the pig case and the brick case, Although the brick case was a regulation, but it was a regulation case on We had really opposite situations, right? The pink case, yeah. You know, the, the guy who was the owner of the cabin did come to the music. He moved in next to the big farm. And and who won? The farmer. And you could say, oh, well, that explains it. He came to the music. Well, but if, if you look at the at the brick manufacturer, he was there for decades before the uh, uh, residential development grew up around him. Mm -hmm. And say, all those people in those houses, they came with the nuisance. No. The court says that's, a, a, that's effectively a nuisance, and the city's action to um, uh, regulate it out of existence to uh, an ordinance was appropriate because it was a nuisance activity. Even if people came to the nuisance. The, the difference, the real difference between, or the way to explain both of those cases consistently, uh, consistently is not to look at the timeline, but to look at these other contextual factors. In the big case, you look around, what are the surrounding land uses? Farming. Those are the predominant land uses. Farming. I, I don't know if that I mentioned this. Um, I um, actually looked up the, um, the big case on uh, Google Maps. Um, because it gives you a name for the lake, right? So I said, I can find this. This is in this house. And so I looked it up on Google Maps. And use the other satellite you know, photo and you zoom in, and there's still only just a handful of houses along the way. Yeah. And you can, you can you, you, it's, on, it's supposed to be on the east side of the lake, so you can almost figure out exactly which house it is and where that pig barn was. The pig barn did move. Remember at the end of that case, the judge says, Okay, farmer, you win, but you can't mess with the pig barn. Um, but it, it's still. Predominantly an agricultural area, and that's why that's why the farming is. Um, when you look at the brick case, I didn't look, look this up. Here. I don't know why. Um, when you look at the brick case, the, 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 the area that surrounded the brick factory at the time of that litigation was predominantly residential. Even though know, those people came, quote, came to the nuisance. It was uh, deemed uh, appropriate for the city to regulate that um, uh, factory out of existence because it was a nuisance type of factory. Um, and so, um, so look at the factors, look at the context, don't necessarily get hung up on the chronology. Um, okay, war on fireworks. Yes, so. Hmm. What is, okay, thank you for bringing that one. Another one of my copies. So, what is it about spot zoning that we don't want? Means, you know, the, the name itself is, is joy. Spot And like, like uh, coming to the nuisance, it is a conclusion that's derived from the real basis. I don't, today, of all things, I don't bring a marker. Does anybody have a driver's marker that can come? Yeah. So, here's the city. Here's one block in the city. The mere fact that that one property is zoned in a way that it is different from all the other blocks that surround it did not make it improper for the 
The mere fact that this single piece of property is done differently than all its neighbors is not, just by that fact, the basis for declaring the zoning here in the appropriate spot. So don't, don't be tricked into thinking that just because it's different zoning on that one piece of property that somehow it is inherently irredeemably, irredeemably um, defective. It may be, but it's not just because of that mere fact. And um, the cases that we read um, where the court struck down zoning and the proposals for rezoning, calling them spot zoning, were based on substantive due process. They were based on a failure to show some sort of logical rationale based in policy for treating this one property, one property different from its name. It was you know, uh, uh, um, arbitrary and capricious, right? Because the city had failed to show how this treated this property, uh, property differently um, jive in some rational way with the policy of the city. So it is not just, just because it's treated differently, it's not, um, uh, really, it's, it's not spot zoning. It, it, that term, if you think about it for a while, it, that term really doesn't have any meaning anymore because anytime uh, government acts in a way that's arbitrary or capricious, in any context, it's defective. Constitutionally effective for failure to um, comply with the requirements of substance abuse process. Um, and so, this is just one example of a failure of, uh, of government to act in a way that um, constitutes the process. It's a really actually a great summary of the protocol. Yeah, so we had one of the cases that we read. Um, there was a proposal to rezone a piece of property on the corner. Two uh, country roads, um, in a kind of exurban area that was growing. Um, all the surrounding properties were zoned uh, residential, and the proposal was to rezone this corner lot to commercial. And the uh, surrounding uh, neighbors sued the city uh, to try to stop the rezoning, claiming that it was a spot zone, a case of spot zone, it was an obvious case of spot zone. It's a single property, but treating it differently from all the other properties. And the court said, no. It's completely legitimate. Why? Because the city was able to show how this rezoning proposal connected the city policy embedded in the city comprehensive general plan that encouraged um, integration of commercial uses into residential neighborhoods to reduce reliance on the automobile, reduce congestion, air pollution, um, try to encourage more active lifestyle. I can't remember what all but they were all kind of braided out for us in that in that opinion. And we go, oh yeah, this proposal to treat this property differently from all the other ones fits right in with the city policy. It is logical, not arbitrary or capricious. And so it was it was fine. It went on. The, the, the places where cities have got into trouble were in those places where they failed to show how the proposed rezoning connected to the city plan, connected to broader policy statements, where they seem to be just out of the, you know, from out of the Good. Thank you. Yes? Is the city required if they do a rezoning like that to allow that use in the city somewhere? Good, good. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, that was also lurking in this question. We really didn't talk about that issue this time around uh, in this course. We have talked about it in previous years, um, and that's, I think, how it got into this question you know, a few years ago. Um, it's not something that we discuss, so I'm not expecting you to address that. Um, I'm glad you talked about it. That's cool. 
Uh, there is a difference of opinion on that. It's an unsettled question. Um, is it required that cities allow anything, at least some of them, within their boundaries? And generally, the answer um, uh, 50 years ago is very different from the answer you get today. 50 years ago, you would find more courts that would agree that the cities have to provide at least some place for every kind of Now, not so much. Um, yeah, and especially, you know, you talk about fringe issues. Um, you, you, you have to, uh, does every city have to allow for um, a, a slaughterhouse? Probably not. Um, and we, get, we get extreme examples like the, um, uh, the Bell Terra case that we didn't read, but we saw cited in a couple of places um, where the US Supreme Court said it was okay for a city to just allow single family, um, uh, detached single families on for the entire city. So the thing, implicitly, right there, the court was saying, no, you don't have to provide for all kinds of uses. Okay, let's move on. Um, okay, the wetlands issue. Ten acre parcel, five acres are wetlands, undeliverable wetlands. So what, by that very fact, if you just eliminate it. Yes, the wipeout. Wipe out. So the wipeout's now wiped off the table. Okay. So this is not going to be a big because they have at least, he has at least half of, of his acre that is, is arguably good. Well, there's no, we don't see from the facts that there's anything bottom is uh, um, development aspirations on this path of life. So, what do we analyze this? In? How do we assess whether there's a thing or not? Because that's not the end of the, um, of the calculation, right? Remember our differential. Yeah, well, you, you have a little short the case name that it comes from Penn Central. Yeah, so Penn Central analysis. Three factors under Penn Central the degree of economic impact, a lot to a little, the degree to which reasonable investment back expectations have been nested, a lot to a little. Sliding scale and the character of the regulation is it more physical invasion ish or is it more just a reallocation of benefits and burdens on a broad scale, which is what general government does? And there's what to do with the person who's been seen with that. That's what the, that last factor is. That's what that last factor is. Do about that. How much, to what degree, is this guy shouldering a disproportionate share of the Or is it something that's shared in the blood? That's what that last time is. I learned something. You know what I'm saying, right? You're basically asking how many people are sharing this guy's thing, that last factor, the character, the character of the regulation. Probably okay. Pro I mean, the city is probably okay. This regulation is probably okay. These guys probably not going to get any money out of that. Other issues here? Again, you know, there's the substance abuse process. Is this a, a legitimate area of governmental concern? Yeah. Um, we said about that way. You know, the water storage issue would be a flooding, etc. That's an obvious possibility. Um, okay, so now we go to the cabana cabins on the beach, um, dry sand beach. This one is uh, clearly I've written uh, this whole thing in response. I was thinking that the speaking for this kind of beach, I wrote the thing. And uh, it's you know, that for hours now. Um, and I uh, made it a little bit more, even more clear cut than Stephen because he doesn't have this guy, doesn't have any of the uh, property. This is all dry sand. Stevens at least half the, about half the lot is 
on the on the block. Yeah, the dog rocks in. Um, it's just a cut of it. Why is it dry sand? Because it's not always rock. If there's no vegetation on it, that tells you that there's a fair amount of salt water that's infiltrated into the high tide that storm. So, um, and as you've already had, there's a prescriptive uh, easement issue here. Um, and again, uh, like the student's case, Christ is not going to do so well here. It's simply the analysis probably will show that you didn't own the right to exclude people because of the uh, pre existence of this prescriptive But you could argue that it could be as uh, as I uh, said before, um, my uh, concern is mainly with receiving the issue, analyzing the issue, uh, articulating it correctly, identifying the, the fact correctly, um, whether you come out with a conclusion that I can not so important. You get the point I do. So you say, no, Chris, you can definitely win this case. It's like, okay. Well, you saw the issues. Good point. Um, um, oh, and then we've got video surveillance. This is a lot of cases, right? There, you win. This, even though ours is a, a, a non governmental contractor, uh, it's not the government itself. Coming in, if the uh, contractor is coming in at the government's behest, and uh, any sort of physical invasion. And if my says I'm going to report in the letter, they say, they come on this day, do that, and look at it and say, ask me this day, or you know, do it after the day. Experience out there? Yeah, uh, I see that kind of stuff happening. In that coming in could be like a procedural due process. Procedural, you mentioned that before. Um, yeah, I guess. Um, proper notification. But I mean, the, the requirements that you're referring to on the procedural due process are kicked in when there's an administrative action. Not when there's a legislative action. And so the question would be is this, the precursor question that you would have to ask is, is, is this legislative or administrative? I think it's an argument it's legislative, even though it's affecting, in this case, him individually, but it's affecting everybody in his group, all motel, hotel owners, with this entire, inside this entire town. So I'm not sure, but you could, you could make the argument that it's administrative. Where, where I would be really impressed is if you did that. You'd say, before you jump into a procedural due process, you'd say, well, if this was, if, if this can be considered to be an administrative act, there may be some uh, procedural due process concerns here. We assess or evaluate whether a particular action is administrative or legislative. How? How do you do that? What's the, how do you tell the difference between an administrative act and a legislative act? How many other people are the facts? Administrative is uh, enforcing existing codes in the book. So if the legislature is passing code, that affects the situation. So, so. so the degree to which it's lawmaking or law applying is one factor. The geographic scope is another factor. And related to that is the number of people affected. So if it's war, or, or law making, it's going to be more likely legislative. If it affects large areas of geography, it's more likely to be legislative. If it affects large numbers of people, it's more likely to be legislative. And if the opposite is true, then it's more likely to be a mutual feedback, it's more likely to be administrative. And that determination kicks in those uh, procedural due process concerns of notice, one, second, 
hearing and an opportunity to present and rebut evidence at a hearing in front of a unbiased decision maker who at the end of the process makes a reasoned result that is based on the correct law and is supported by substantial evidence. Which is more than a chinchilla. Chinchilla. Evidence that a reasonable person would accept as is demonstrated in the bonds. A failure to comply with the purpose on the other relevant criteria. And if it's administrative, that means also it's something that could be appealed. Um, but it means it can't be put on the ballot. Only legislative issues can go on the ballot in the referendum. <coughs> oh, I, I, I was just talking to you about what you know, uh, suggested. Maybe there was a procedural due process issue there, and so I thought I'd take that as an opportunity. I don't think it's here. I, 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 don't, I think this is legislative uh, uh, action. And uh, we don't have any evidence that there's any determination of um, individual application of this um, uh, legislative scheme. It's not even facts. If it had been, maybe it would be a closer question to that particular hearing that's the case. Um, so uh, I don't think it's here. I was just using Um, you might say, well, there's a privacy issue here. Yeah, you know, that's here too. But we didn't really study privacy. So I wasn't gonna... Anybody see any other issues? Those are the issues that I saw. And that's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. Hmm. Yeah. Um, again, I mean, we, we did read about rightness uh, in the CD case uh, last week, week before, um, but it's that, I'm, I'm not so concerned about that issue. Um, uh, that's kind of a lawyer issue. Um, that is the law school, you learn all about it. Um, as far as planners and, and developers are concerned about the text, it's not. But you're right. I mean, he hasn't. Um, he doesn't look like he has um, uh, availed himself of any administrative opportunity here. Um, except, well, his subdivision plot has been rejected. So that <laughs> is probably. I mean, he might have a local appeal that he has to go through before he sues the board of In fact, I'm not certain that he, it's an administrative action. So. Um, this he would have to uh, um, uh, go through a local appeal of the board to escape for a location. Um, and same with this um, proposal for his abandonment of the evidence. So, um, yeah, those are probably not quite the right yet. Oh, it doesn't have to do anything for the security man. Um, that's right. And I don't know if you know about that. I don't I think it's not right for the um, uh, for the fireworks factory because nothing's happened yet. He's just sitting there and he's trying to keep the hand of strike here and the place of the But that's a lot. Already, I've said too much about something I don't want you to know. I don't care that you know that. If you want to know that, I'm not going to pretend to be a secret. I'm not going to pretend to be a secret. I'm code. Um, you know, it, it was always at that moment when parents of young children um, um, get busted with the spelling words in front of their kids. Talk about the subject of the 
And it's like, if they've got smart kids, they don't have a shot. Wow. Well, it's like, so you're going to have to accelerate the door. Other issues on this question? Okay. Um, let's go uh, shift to uh, our study guide. And uh, we talked about CPP process, we just talked about CPP process. Um, we talked a lot about cookies. Um, I haven't talked about public use doctrine much. Let's see what this is doing. Um, this is the uh, focuses on the, the phrase, uh, the words in the taking clause of the fifth amendment that says, nor shall private be property, not, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. What does public use mean? You know, first, it, it's not literally public use. It doesn't have to be the public actually using the property to qualify. I mean, this is required. It can be a public purpose. A public purpose is a slippery concept. What is a public purpose? How do we know one? I mean, in an extreme case, like this, I'd say this is an extreme case. Taking private, uh, private property and giving it to a multinational corporation. Um, is it a public purpose or not? Well, they're creating jobs, they're creating economic development, they're creating revenue for, uh, for city operations that will build libraries and public plazas and community centers. Those are all public uses. Absolutely. Um, the, the key is whether there is a well-constructed plan that logically connects to a legitimate governmental purpose. It's starting to sound a little um, substitute pro uh, uh, process issue, um, but if that's what the court is saying, um, in order for it to qualify um, for eminent domain authority, because that's what we're really talking about. I don't know if you pick up on that. This is not about the police power, right? This is about eminent domain power. And we've kind of you know, conflated the two of this ever since Justice Holmes told us that if it goes too far, we kind of mutt and mesh the two. But they really are uh, distinct. And so what we're talking about here is a limitation in eminent domain power. And for most of the semester, I think we can, well, the only real limit for eminent domain is just compensation. Governments can come and take property, do it, do it, whatever they want to, as long as they pay for it, as long as it's a fair value. We can quibble about whether that's true in the case, but we understand that as long as they reach that minimum level, that threshold level, they can do whatever they want. What Hugo tells us is, yeah. Yes, no, not really. Um, that the, the taking, the, the use of eminent domain power has to be connected somehow logically to some legitimate area of government concern. It has to be some legitimate public purpose that's being served here. And it has to be done so in a logical fashion. With what a well considered, well constructed. That's what you know. Any questions about this, the materials that we've covered in the past two or three weeks? The reading standard stuff, the last time we were talking about community related developments, transfer of development rights. You know, what I hope is that you could outline what I want you to take away from that stuff. Which is, and I've said this before, I'll say it again. Uh, my intent here is not to give you a complete education in each one of these topics, the substance of these topics. We've got other courses that do that. Um, and, I, and my intent here is not to uh, repeat those. Uh, when you want to really learn 
about um, concurrency or TDRs, take Chris Nelson's uh, Open Book Management class. It's a great class. If you want to learn more about green buildings and, and using third party standards, we've got uh, two or three uh, courses. There's a course this um, summer on form based codes, for example, which is not the same, but it's a uh, 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 Transit oriented development, uh, Dr. Yuri has his uh, land use and transportation um, class and has another one. So, if you go over the classes where you get substance on, on these policies, what we are trying to do here is to um, observe how these policies express themselves in regulatory terms, in legal terms. Where are the legal pitfalls that are the constitutional issues? How do they connect to accept the legal terms? That's what we can do. So, um, I, I, and if you, we're hoping for more on these topics. Um, sorry if it's frustrating, but um, if you consider this a teaser so that you can investigate yeah, the more pleasure example of the way the response is not I don't know if I don't know if I have one. I'll look. I'll look and see if I have one for these questions. Um, uh, because um, it just happened that I had one for that uh, midterm. Um, I'm I I confess I, I'm more on the lookout for those kinds of answers to midterm questions than in the final questions that I've seen that in the midterm. You can go through the semester that I've seen that you wanted to see that. Uh, but I'll see if I've got some. Okay. Do you think you could post on the midterm? You mean the midterm exam? Oh, sure. Exist without the legislature? Does it just exist like if I have something and I want to sell it to somebody? The bundle of sticks works, but does the TDR part of it? Okay, think about it. TDR is the, it's a market system, right? And the market system only works if there's a buyer. And well, you have to sell it too, but I mean, having people who are willing to sell off their development rights. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's inconsequential, it's moody. It, it doesn't matter unless there's somebody out there who wants to buy it, and they're only going to be motivated to buy it if it has value. And the only way they're going to get value is if the government has set up a system to give it to them, right? So, you have a Sending property, you know, is trying to export their development right off of this property. It has to be translated into some sort of unit of exchange. And then that unit of exchange has to be translated again into some sort of development benefit. And usually what it is, is some sort of uh, uh, density bonus that buying this increment of development right will allow the purchaser to do something with their property that they wouldn't otherwise be allowed to do because of zoning restrictions in the zone. And so, um, like I say, usually it's some sort of uh, density bonus. Uh, the, um, Penn Central case, Grand Central Station, that was a, a TDR case. We talked about it a little bit when we were passing through um, in our review of tape. Um, the way the TDR system worked there is um, the sending site was Grand Central Terminal. Um, the air rights, specifically the air rights above the terminal, because the terminal was already more constructed. I'm, I'm, Anyway, so it's the air rights above the terminal here that is being exported, turned into some sort of TDR unit of exchange that would be, uh, excuse me, potentially um, usable on 
half a dozen or so of the surrounding the properties that surround that particular parcel. So the, the, it was a very restricted system. I think it's still in operation. I don't think it's working. Wow. Probably because it's a very restricted system. I think you could only like, use those TDR credits on properties you know, uh, 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 that were in you know, five block radius of the, of the station. And what they have allowed you to do? Well, in their existing zoning, you could build this five. Um, with the uh, TDR uh, units that you buy, the dump lights that you buy from Grand Central, it would allow you to build. So that implement of law is on Which tells you again that we talked about this before. In order for uh, there to be a TDR market, the zoning has to be restricting development below where the market is, below where the market wants to be, for so there to be any sort of value in the TDR units. And um, sometimes I, I feel something. Yeah. I don't know Well, I'm thinking of or that the sense of looking up all this land and what if and how to use it now they didn't densify it to go in the town. This is this is not so much an issue in Oregon because they their um uh limit on the at least the horizontal expansion of development is limited uh, to regulation. Not through not through ownership. But in, uh, some of the other examples, this is can this can be a problem. For example, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, we talked about Amish County, where um, government has been using TERs and other um, uh, similar uh, related um, initiatives like uh, buying and conservation easements and, and so forth um, to create a uh, green belt. Around um, cities, and so you have a, a city like this. That's the edge of the development, um, and then you've got a green belt that surrounds that that turns it in. Um, London has, has a green belt. Um, Manchester, um, all the major metropolitan areas have a green belt uh, established right after World War II, um, and they are ownership based, and, and that can create uh, just the problem that you're talking about. Over the decades, centuries, places grow, and you do need more land. And if you uh, hand it all in through this ring of uh, uh, restricted uh, development rights, where does that market express itself? In the case of London, it expresses it out here. And so you end up with this leak. And so and you, you get to start, you, you kind of start to get this bullseye effect. You get these, Concentric circles of development, green belt development, green belt. Maybe that's a good, I don't know, you could make an argument that that's a um, uh, desirable urban form. It's not a very efficient one for infrastructure. It tends to be for long commutes for some reason. You know, in the case of London, um, this is where Reading is, and we are referring to Reading, it's out here. And on the other side of the green belt, Reading is generally uh, um, a uh, bedroom community. Or people who are working in central London. So there's a, there's a lot of extra commuting because this all up here is locked up. Um, again, on balance, maybe that's a good thing. Access to open space, you know, um, it's kind of, instead of having Central Park, it's a uh, circumferential park. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But I don't think they intended that when they, when they started that approach. And I think, you know, people from Oregon say, well, that's why I call park system is so secure. Um, because with the regulatory system, the urban road boundaries, they are designed to extend. And they can. And they have. And then um, there's a demonstrated uh, market need for what they can develop. This is really the regulatory boundary. And property rights are not changed. Uh, you could, um, uh, uh, we install development rights on a piece of property once they have departed, if you will. I mean, they're funded. That's the thing we learned from transfer of development rights, is that development rights, like many other rights associated with property, 
They, they are uh, fungible, they are transferable, you can move them around, you can ship them from here to over there, and if you want, you can ship them like that. Um, think about it, you can say, well, how can that happen? Well, because it's all human creation anyways, it's all abstraction, um, it's, you know, paperwork that people figure out how to so, um, instead of the transfer of development rights, you know, it's, it's easier to uh, talk about this in the context of uh, uh, conservation easement. So, the development rights to uh, uh, the air uh, space above Grand Central could have been donated or purchased, donated to uh, a nonprofit um, historic preservation organization. National Trust for Historic Preservation could have been the nonprofit organization that received the development rights from the um, Penn Central uh, Corporation for um, the ability to build in this airspace. And Penn Central could have donated it and received a pretty hefty tax write off. And we would have seen a reduction in the assessed value of their property because they no longer can maximize their development potential there. So there might have been tax advantages, and that many people who engage in donated conservation easements or donated uh, development rights, that's the easy the calculation you can make. Or the nonprofit um, could have, uh, I think this could be a, um, a business transaction, and they could be offering money to the consumption of the development rights. They then hold those development rights. They don't go away. It's kind of like the, um, um, the second law of thermal uh, dynamics. You know, the mass is not, for example, first of all, the mass is neither created nor destroyed. It's just transferred, right? Uh, and the, 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 the parallel here is that property interests, property rights, are neither created or destroyed. They are just transferred. In the case here, the rights developed is being transferred. It's being uh, extracted. Uh, from its association with this piece of uh, geography and uh, being uh, shifted to this nonprofit, but they could get it back or sell it. Um, or in the case of uh, the restrictive covenants, we talked about this um, with our um, um, quasi factual um, land sale in uh, California, the land that had a cultural land that could sell um, this story told. Um, uh, with a uh, restricted covenant prohibiting the going of grace on a piece of property. Anytime you have a restricted covenant, what you're essentially doing is you're exporting a development interest off of that property into the hands of someone else. In this case, the right or the ability to use the property for what they call the building grace has been exported off the property via the restricted covenant to some other party. And that other party holds that right. It doesn't go away. They hold that right. And under the right circumstances, it's the right amount of money. It can be reimported and reattached to the piece of property. Uh, a local example that is between private institutions is the City Creek Project by the church. The church owned the ground underneath the property. Uh, we had given a long term ground lease to the mall operators at yeah. uh, Crossroads. Uh, and yet, uh, during their ownership of the leasehold position, we actually went in and bought the air rights over the mall. Uh, are, are we in maintaining some of those rights? And so, when we uh, when we built the City Creek Mall, we actually had to just buy out that middle piece yeah. of the leasehold position. So, so and, and this home is another is another example. If you do this piece of property, what do you do? You are the owner, you're the landlord, and you lease to a tenant. You are taking certain rights out of your bundle, temporarily, according to the terms of the lease, and handing them over to uh, the tenant. The right to exclusive possession. You're, in exchange for money, you are transferring that. And at the end of the lease, what happens? Infected. Or uh, when regulation, when property is regulated, regulated through zoning, what happens? If, if uh, 
let's say you're digging into some land that have been regulated before and never had any zoning, all of a sudden, boom, you're in the city, you decide to institute zoning, this piece of property is, which previously could have been used for anything, because there's no regulation, now can only be used for residential purposes. What happened to that development right? It's been restricted, right? If you use the analogy, the stick has been short. And they're, they're, the short part of the stick that still it, it remains with the owner of the property is that associated with residential purposes and all the other parts of that stick that had to do with commercial or industrial or any other kinds of uses. It's gone. Where did it go? It went into a common pool with all the other parts of sticks from all the other property owners that all got zoned residential. And it's being held by hmm, the government, collectively. Government could change the zoning. It could decide, you know, that was a bad idea. Zoning stupid. We're getting rid of zoning. We're going to just uh, eliminate a zoning board. If that happened, all of those little sticks, you just see them march out of, you know, out of the chimney, whatever you need to march, they kind of float out of the chimney uh, at the top of City Hall, and they all go back to their uh, pieces of property. Very fancy. But that, that's effectively, or at least theoretically, what we're talking about here. So these, these property interests, and it's a good thing that we kind of need to have that you know, These property interests are always in flux. They're always fluid, and they're shifting about. And, uh, and sometimes um, the shifts are um, small, or subtle, or slow moving, in which case we're more likely to accept them. And sometimes they happen. Um, uh, sharply or um, in a catastrophic or quick way, in which case we uh, uh, might react you know, negatively. That's simply typically what happens when you see some sort of ticking case from you know, Mr. Lucas, all of a sudden, you know, boom, one day he can't develop his property. All of a sudden it happens, right? Um, it, it gets, it's one of those sudden shifts in the, in the who owns what sticks and what bundles. Uh, it's when those sudden shifts happen, you start to see. Uh, lawsuits and people getting pretty uh, um, upset. One of the most common in um, City Creek, uh, the solid goal in the store, we negotiate, we try to negotiate them out for a very long lease just to occupy the building. We never could buy out their lease, and hence that building remains and we built for more around it. Flower Patch? Flower Patch, yeah. Flower Patch, the corner of Fifth South and State Street. Now it's like about ready to be eaten by the uh, Grand American Hotel. Why is that still there? That person refused to sell the Earl Holding God bless his soul. Um, and just decided he, at any price, and I can't imagine how much he must have offered in that last, the last go around. Said, no way, I am not selling to you. So it's going to be back. It's going to be back. And also put the light up inside the spider. Um, no, this question, I don't know if you already answered, sorry, yeah, but what, is the, is the format going to be exactly the same as the midterm? Yes. Is there any more questions than no. right now? Yeah. And same, the same question as you've got, since here might be a little bit longer. Right. And how much time do you have? Uh, two hours. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm going to have a long period. Yeah. From this way? Yes, from this way. How much do you expect to do? Previous material? Roughly half. You know, mm -hmm. um, that sounds good at that. Um, but I always want to look there. I, I, one year I had a student who just thought that the exam was the same time as the class. And he said that different day. Really tough to have a So, that's why I just put two items to the paper equivalent be on lights around. It also says 3 a.m. Yes, it does. And so, yes, it's at 3 a.m. <laughs> so I said, no, it's a different time. <laughs> and yeah, and so you, you have uh, 14 hours. <laughs> so, break food. Uh, no, it's uh, 3 30 p.m. next Monday. Um, this Thursday, this is reading day, 
Um, but I'll be here. I, I might be a little bit late. We have um, interviews for um, the new team of the graduates. So um, I'll be here Um, but I will be there if you want to come and talk more about these issues or anything else. Um, before you go, um, it's been my pleasure to be with you this semester. Um, sometimes people thank me, and, and that's nice. Um, but um, I'm here to thank you um, because um, uh, some people think that teachers are you know, selfless, giving, generous. And I'm none of this. I am completely in this for myself. And here's how. Here's how it all works. See, I am old. You are young. I am of the generation that screwed things up. You are the generation that I can fix them. So that I can retire in a nice, comfortable community, right? Because you guys are going to go out there and create one for me so that my wife and I so, thank you in advance for all the good work that you are going to do um, when you become professional planners and real estate developers because you can go out there and save the world. You are. That's your job. So, um, I'm, I'm sorry, my generation, we've got the same charge when I was in your uh, position um, uh, many years ago. And I'm sorry we didn't get back to you. But, I'm going to be back to you. Thank you very much. I'll see you next week.